Welcome back to the Buckeye Breakdown Podcast. I'm Brendan Gulick, along with Ducks Digest publisher Max Torres. As Ohio State continues uh, our, our series here of scouting the opponent in the middle of the week, we've had enough time to digest a little bit what we think we expect. Now we dive in with, with an insider, somebody who knows what we're going to expect, or at least uh, somebody who can give us a little bit better perspective from following the team closely. Max, you're the lucky guy this week. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a fun one, Brendan. I'm excited to to get out there to Columbus and uh, you know watch this game after after all the build up. This uh, I think maybe that's a great place to start. Build up, um, boy. The, this game would have happened a year ago, and I think there were an awful lot of people that uh, would have enjoyed an opportunity as Buckeye fans to go out to Oregon. I know a lot of people had had plans to do that, and and obviously the game fell through. So. You know, perhaps even more uh, bent up anticipation in this one, considering that they didn't play a year ago. On top of the fact that the last two time, last time that these two teams played was for a national championship. Yeah, it's uh, it's one that people have been waiting for for quite some time. Uh, you talk about it not working out last year. Even if the the pandemic hadn't been a thing, the the wildfires out here were absolutely insane. So I don't know if that would have even even been a, a possibility. But we're here now. Uh, Ducks looking for maybe a little bit of a shot at revenge after that national championship uh, heartbreaker, and uh, man, Ohio State's gonna gonna give them a, a good run. Why don't we start with the biggest storyline right off the top? You know, we can we can look big picture, we can talk Pac-12. There's a lot of things I, I'd like to get to, but I'd be remiss um, in, in not serving the fans appropriately here if I didn't ask about Kayvon right away. Um, Give us the the best information that you can on on what you saw, what you've heard from him this past week. You know, we know that he was you know in street clothes, in a walking boot on the sideline in the second half of the Fresno game. Um, and and the the latest we've heard is that he's day to day. What can you tell us about Kayvon Thibodeau and, and his uh, potential availability this weekend? Not a lot of uh, new information to report uh, outside of what you just said, uh, Brendan. But uh, we, we did see that, or we did hear rather from, from Mario Cristobal on Monday, uh, a little bit of an update saying that uh, it indeed was uh, an ankle sprain. Um, I was watching the, the replay and it looked like, I think it was defensive lineman Christian Williams got rolled up on him, got, got pushed into, into cave on. And, you know, he obviously came out for a bit after that. Um, and then he was able to come back in and played a little bit um, after the initial injury. And then, uh, ultimately got, got taken out again by the, by the Oregon staff. So that gives you some, you know, some bit of confidence or should give Oregon fans, I should say some confidence that, that he, uh, you know, what would probably be available this week. Um, but we're, we're still waiting for an official announcement on that. Uh, we're supposed to talk to Mario Cristobal today um, around noon uh, Pacific. So um, that's, it's Wednesday and um, We'll we'll see if we have any any new info to report there, but but Cristobal has been known to play injuries very very close to the vest, especially when it's the best player on the team. No doubt about that. What what makes Kayvon such a special talent? I mean, it's easy to watch him and and you know he's got the wow factor, but from somebody who's seen him regularly and and maybe has spent a little bit of time around him within the program, what, what makes him a a special talented player? Yeah, I mean, it, you got to start with with the pass rush for sure, and I think just uh, you know the versatility in, in his arsenal. Uh, he he had a video the other day on Pac-12 Network, the the art of the pass rush, and I just think that the motor that he plays with and, and how creative he can get with his moves, how, how fast he is, and another part I think that's really special that people maybe don't talk about enough is how he's developed as a run stopper as well. Uh, came into to college as someone that was really lauded for his pass rushing ability, but He's he's really honed in on his craft and you know taken big steps you know since since getting here to Eugene and I think that when you look at his overall game and just his ability to to absolutely take over and uh, you know impact uh, a whole offense we saw it when he wasn't av available against Fresno State that that pass rush really struggled and if you have that pass rush it, it really just elevates your defense to a whole other level so um, that that's probably what I would say stands out the most about Thibodeau. I, I don't want to get uh, crazy in terms of subject hopping all over the place, but uh, I felt like starting with him had to be appropriate. Maybe let's pull back now and, and go more at a macro level. Um, sure. You well, know, it, it's it's an interesting league this year. Uh, it it so far seems like it might be a better league and a more competitive league than national pundits are giving it credit for. Um, I realize it was not a great first game for Oregon against Fresno State, but 
when you win, you win, and that's obviously most important. Um, you know, perhaps UCLA is going to present the biggest challenge uh, in in conference. They've gotten gotten off to a really good start. G give Ohio State fans um, a ten thousand foot view of of what the program right now is like in Eugene, the momentum that maybe you think you have or you don't have, and and you know how that all kind of fits into the the Pac twelve picture at the moment. Yeah, it's a great question, Brendan. Um, I think when you're looking at Oregon from uh, like that 10,000 foot view, like like you were mentioning, it's it's a program that has completely you know turned around since Mario Cristobal took over, entering year four as as the head coach. Now he's he's getting his recruiting classes, uh, you know, under his belt. They're they're getting to Eugene and into the program, uh, albeit a lot of the guys are you know still pretty young, um, in that regard. But uh, the, the Ducks have have really taken a step forward, you know, back to back Pac-12 titles here, played in some really big games. You look at that Rose Bowl in, uh, in 2020 with uh, Justin Herbert or 2019, I should say. No, it was 2020. Sorry about that. I got my, my dates mixed up. In 2020 Rose Bowl, I do it all the time. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So so they're, they're winning some some big games, um, you know. Uh, taking taking back control of that rivalry over Washington, even though they didn't play last year. But when they they have the victory the last time they played, but like I said, the recruiting talent's getting uh, just elevating every year. Uh, looks like and and they're getting more NFL development with that. So they're getting guys to Eugene and then doing something with that talent, sending guys off to to the league in, in the first round. Um, but I think kind of with all of that hype. They, they maybe haven't had the the best success recently. You know, what have you done for me lately kind of a deal against Iowa State in that Fiesta Bowl. They just looked really, really outmatched um, with that physicality. And, and you know, Brees Hall ran the ball all over them. And, and the Iowa State tight ends just kind of had their way. So when you look at all of that, all the, the hype that's been building around this program, you know, you see the places in, that are in place uh, for success and to, you know, go to even new heights because they want to go farther than the Pac-12 championship, obviously, in a game like this. But, man, it's it's hard not to be underwhelmed with that Fresno State game. So all the pieces are there, but can they really execute? Can they be disciplined? And can they, you know, get points up on the board and, uh, you know, hold, hold a, a top team uh, to uh, low numbers on defense? It's, it's kind of a, a mixed bag, but that, that's kind of what uh, – I think I rambled a little bit, but that's kind of what we're seeing. Hey, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure it was a bit underwhelming, only beating Fresno by seven, um, but certainly had some some highlight, good big plays in that game. But I am curious how Oregon fans are maybe relishing in Washington's gigantic stub of their toe against Montana. Um, I know Ohio State fans enjoy seeing Michigan struggle. Uh, at least most of them do. Um, how, how did Oregon fans react this week when, now that Washington is playing Michigan, by the way, how, how did Oregon fans uh, take the the Montana victory? Oh man, it, it was. Uh, they were they were relishing in it. That's for sure. Um, you know, you never want to like uh, harp on a team not doing well, but uh, I had to I had to throw it. A tweet out there and just say, Hey, you know, Washington lost and then you go get some engagement there. So they're loving it, especially when your team barely escapes uh, and is the only Pac-12 North team to win. Uh, I feel like the Ducks just love bagging on the Huskies uh, when, whenever possible. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Um, let's dive in more maybe into the personnel. Anthony Brown is a pretty athletic quarterback. I, I think we saw uh, a, a nice burst from him on essentially the game winning touchdown. Uh, wh what do you think are his best traits as a, as a leader, as a player? And, you know, why, why is he the guy to lead this Oregon offense? Yeah, I'll start with the last part of your question there. Why is he the guy to lead? Uh, I think when you're, when the staff was looking at this uh, question, the situation, they wanted to have a guy that was experienced, especially when you're playing a game on the big stage like this, you don't want to be trotting out a young guy unless you really have to. Um, in such a, a crazy setting uh, like you guys have out there in Columbus. But uh, when I'm looking at Brown and kind of what he brings to the table, he, he ran, I believe it was 16 carries uh, against Fresno State, and he did some good damage there. So Joe Moorhead didn't waste any time, uh, you know, trying to utilize his full skill set. Um, and I, I think that that he he does a good job of, of finding the open man when, when possible. And I think he's got a better deep ball than, than people really give him credit for. That was something that a lot of the fans were up in arms about 
um, after that that week one game. Just uh, and you can understand why, right? Like you know, a lot of people say you don't want to reveal too much of your of your playbook. Um, maybe some of your players you don't want to you know show the whole arsenal and, and give your opponent an advantage there. But uh, I think that they're they're definitely going to have to to open it up a little bit and, and push the ball down the field. That's the thing I'm going to be really looking for from Anthony Brown. Uh, he looked really confident in that Fiesta Bowl when you know when he was going back and forth with Tyler Shuck. Um, I feel like he had some some really good confidence with uh, with his decisions and um, you know was was, uh, was tucking the ball down when he needed to. So I think having a guy that has confidence in himself and is willing to take some risks. I saw that in the Fiesta Bowl. Now I'm waiting for it uh, to see it a little bit more come Saturday. How about in terms of uh, the balance in the offense, you know, and, and what you think you might have in the rushing attack? I realized last week was um, maybe more balanced than than uh, you know having one guy kind of you know carry the big load. Uh, but CJ Verdell and, and Travis Die, you know, high praise for that group. Do you, are they serviceable? Um, what are what are the expectations from the running backs? Running backs are, are definitely a position of strength uh, for the Ducks this year, just as, as in pretty much every year. And uh, I think, you know, fans are feeling confident about what they have in that running back stable. Uh, Verdell's, they're listed as co-starters now in Crystal Ball saying, you know, we, we do that because we, we use their name in the same sentence all the time. So they, they feel like they have a really good one-two punch. Mastro calling them the best tandem in, in the Pac-12. And I feel like the numbers have have largely supported that. Uh, CJ Verdell, you know, he, he got a little bit banged up last year, but – when he's on and the offensive line's throwing blocks, he's he's a, a really really good weapon. And you have Travis Dye as well, who uh, he had an amazing season last year, particularly on the receiving end, was just super super explosive, catching passes out of the backfield and making plays. So um, those are two guys that I think are are going to be uh, you know really really important for for this offense to get things going. And then they have three freshmen that haven't even touched the field yet, Trey Benson. Uh, had a season ending injury last year. And then you have uh, some guys that did really well in fall camp and Byron Carbwell and Seven McGee, certainly generating a lot of buzz. And uh, I think that it's good that you have a lot of experience there, but then you also have some intrigue with those young guys that are looking for their first taste of the action. How about on the wide receiving side, Johnny Johnson the third certainly seems like your, your premier talent. Does that group have some depth to it? That's what it certainly feels like, at least on the outside looking in. Johnny Johnson uh, had a great game. Uh, against Fresno State. Um, I think he's just developed leaps and bounds since he got here. Uh, freshman year, he, he really struggled and, and, uh, and you know, reeling in some, some of those passes, but I feel like he's one of the most consistent guys on the team now. Uh, you know, you say that, Brendan, but I feel like the Ducks are still looking for that bona fide number one, at least statistically. They haven't really had that in the past. People having a lot of similar stat lines, but it looks like the depth should be there. Talk to wide receiver coach Brian McClendon all throughout fall camp, and he's saying, you know, I, I know we have a lot of really talented wide receivers in this group, particularly from that 21 recruiting hall, three high school all Americans, but he was very blunt saying they haven't really done anything yet. You know, I want, I want people to say you have a really productive room, not a really talented room. So we'll see, uh, we'll hopefully see more of Troy Franklin this week. He was, he was limited last week uh, against Fresno state. And then you have guys like Dante Thornton as well, uh, six foot four, six foot five wide receiver with track speed. Uh, so hopefully we'll see more of those guys and, and maybe Devin Williams as well, the USC transfer who who broke out a little bit last year with multiple 100-yard receiving games. But they, they really got to get things going in the pass game and get creative uh, in this one, I think. Max Torres from Ducks Digest, our guest this week on uh, Ohio State's scouting report of the Oregon Ducks. Uh, Max, tell us a little bit about the offensive line because Ohio State's defensive strength is perhaps up front. Um, they they often generate pressure, but in the last uh, last year, and then frankly again, you know, with the exception of two sacks in this in this recent game against Minnesota, uh, the Buckeyes have struggled a bit to actually come up with sacks, uh, but they certainly have created a lot of pressure and a lot of chaos. Uh, is the Oregon line up for the task there? Yeah, I think I think they are, and that, that's a, an interesting point that you mentioned about the Buckeyes' defensive line. Because I was watching film with the Minnesota game, and that was one of the things that stood out to me most. Is like you know they're not really getting uh, as much of a push as people maybe thought. But to bring it back to Oregon, uh, this is you know a really experienced group. Um, all starters return from a year ago, and then you kind of have a sixth man uh, in Stephen Jones. That that was his role last year, but he got a really really heavy dose of of work. Uh, against Fresno State. One of the interesting points that 
that people are, are talking about or I think is is pertinent to look at with this offense is that rotation. Uh, Alex Mirabal, Mario Cristobal, valuing offensive line versatility uh, and, you know, cross training, having guys ready to play a variety of positions at a moment's notice in case anybody but goes down. Uh, Chris Ball was asked if he earlier this week if he thinks that might lead to a lack of chemistry, and he said, "No, we're not. We're not concerned about that." So, um, I think Fresno State that there were some some good times and some bad. You know, late in the game, they really they really pounded the ball well and and turned to the run to move the sticks, which I think is a, a good foundation of of uh, any offensive line. But they have a lot of talent at that position uh, that they're bringing in as well. We saw Jackson Powers Johnson at center get get a little bit of time when Alex Forsythe cramped up. And then you have Kingsley Suamataya, one of the bookend tackles. It's looking like that he could uh, he could be ready if called upon. But certainly an experienced group and someone, or sorry, uh, an area that the coaching staff views as a strength, and it should be a strength. But maybe we didn't see that as much as we wanted to in the opener. How about uh, just from the offensive coordinator perspective, Joe Moorhead is a pretty darn well respected coach in college football. He's had success in a few different places. You know, his career kind of started taking off, I guess, at, at Fordham. Um, I realized he had, you know, had a little bit of time in the Big Ten with Penn State and and now out west with one of the nation's uh, flashiest offenses. Uh, generally happy with the job Joe Moorhead's done so far? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, we definitely saw some, some signs of that creativity last year. Um, if you talk about situations that kind of he's had since, since being at Oregon, Tyler Shuck, uh, his first year as starter last year, Fast forward one year, and now we have Anthony Brown first year again. But I think it'll it, it'll bode well for him to to get a little bit more creative and, and confident with his play calling, just because he's had a guy that's been in the system, um, you know, for 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 two seasons now, and and is experienced, like I was saying earlier. And the fact that he's able to have a full off season, if you think about when he came over during the pandemic, certainly not ideal circumstances. But I, I'd say I'm happy with what I've seen from Moorhead um, as far as the offensive output is concerned, but. It really does feel like the the Ducks have a, a much higher ceiling than than they've attained, obviously in week one, but but maybe since he's been here with with the talent at their disposal and the talent that they've brought in since his arrival. So kind of a yes and no in, in that regard. I'd say overall yes, but but definitely a lot of room for growth. And I think he'd tell you the same. All right, fair enough. Uh before we flip to the defensive side of the ball, we did have a, a question or a comment here, and um I I have you know, continue to encourage that uh, if, if you are watching live with us, uh, we'd love to have you interact and, and drop some questions or comments in along the way. Certainly appreciate you listening after the fact, but uh, we always stream Buckeye Breakdown live on our YouTube, Twitter, and uh, Facebook platform. So feel free to, to join us there uh, if you're listening afterwards. Any concern about D's ability up the middle? The question from uh, AMP5031. So just to, to clarify, do you think they're talking about like the defense's uh, ability in the middle. I'm trying to just make sure I understand the question. Yeah, that's uh, I when I read D's, I wasn't sure if uh, <laughs> if he was referencing a nickname for someone. Uh, maybe we can get some clarification on it. I I would I would imagine that he was probably referencing the defense because I don't I don't think I recognize that name for anybody. Yeah, no, neither do I. But we can we can roll with it. If if you see any comments on your end or anything, maybe we can uh, we can adjust there. But um, you know, look, looking about, we'll just we'll just take it as if it's the defense in, in the you know the the middle in the trenches. Um, like you were saying, Brendan, you know the the offensive line looks like it's a they got some big guys for for Ohio State, and and I think that the Ducks are starting to see some of that depth uh, in the trenches translate over the defensive side of the ball. That they've brought in a lot of awesome talent on the offensive line, and obviously that's that's an area that you want to assume is taken care of under under crystal ball, seeing that he's an offensive line guy and mirror ball is uh, one of the best in the business, but we're seeing the emergence of guys on the defensive line as well. Uh, look at Brandon Dorless as a guy who, who I was really, really uh, supporting last year and kind of beating that drum. And uh, he was named to the PFF national team of the week. Uh, I believe it was called this, this week. And then now we're seeing J guys like Jason Jones, Popo, I'm a Vi, uh, Christian Williams, who I mentioned earlier the, they're, they're really beefing up the, the defensive line as well. And um, I think that Joe Salavea is, is going to have those guys right. And they certainly did a great job defending against the run last week. Uh, I believe they only limited Fresno State to 75 yards on the ground. So I think the Ducks are feeling confident there. But, man, the, the Buckeyes have some tremendous running backs, um, some of which didn't even really see the field in, until the end there. 
um, I believe in that, in that opener, but should be an area of strength, uh, at least on, on the defensive end. And uh, the Ducks are hoping to, to build off that performance from week one. I think maybe the biggest challenge in evaluating Ohio State from week one might have been their lack of snaps. They only took 48 offensive snaps in a game where Ohio State's offense is, you know, traditionally 70 or so. Um, Ryan Day told the media yesterday that in some ways he felt like they played half a game, um, which is a great problem to have when you score, you know, 40 plus points in a game where you only have 48 snaps. And obviously one of those was a defensive touchdown. Um but the last three offensive touchdowns Ohio State scored came on three drives that had a combined six plays and took a combined less than two minutes. Um, certainly love the big strike capability, but you know it's also hard to, to get true evaluations of guys when um, you don't run as many snaps. So uh, I don't know. I guess that's uh, it, it's a quote unquote problem. <laughs> um, why don't we uh, continue evaluating what the defense, you know, w- outside of Kayvon Thibodeau and, and his, you know, potential injury status. Uh, I would think that the biggest storyline coming into the week for your defense uh, is that it sounds like you're going to have two of your, your uh, cornerbacks back after they were suspended last week. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mario Cristobal announcing that uh, cornerback DJ uh, James and safety Jamal Hill uh, will be available this week after after missing week one against Fresno State. So that's certainly a, a nice little injection of of depth for Oregon. Jamal Hill, if, if for those that don't know, came up with two interceptions for the Ducks on the big stage against USC in the Pac-12 title game. The second of which was just absolutely insane. I mean, you can you can look up the highlights. It was kind of like a, a, a receiver toe tap kind of deal. Keaton Slovis is trying to throw it away. And then you look at it on the replay, slowed down, and think, wow, I think he might have gotten that. So Jamal Hill is definitely a guy that proved himself as a playmaker last year in his first piece of uh, his first uh, you know taste of, of significant action. DJ DJ James, uh, someone we haven't seen as much of, but he had some some big pass breakups in that game as well, and he was looking like a projected starter this week. So that's going to be huge for Oregon, especially when you're going up against this absolutely insane crop of wide receivers that Ohio State has. So I, I think that that is uh, going to be something that they really need, and they're going to need amazing games out of those guys. Give, give me an idea here on uh, just the defense, you know, uh, as an entire unit. What what, um, what what are the expectations for this group this year? You know, Oregon's offense seems like it has the ability to put up, you know, uh, quite a bit of points. I'm not sure they're quite as explosive as they had been maybe five, ten years ago, but still have a pretty good offense. Uh, Is it the kind of defense that, you know, the expectation is, well, they're going to play well enough to keep us in games and, you know, we can typically outscore whatever we give up? uh, Or are there instances where you're you're kind of leaning on the defense to keep you in it? I think when when you're looking at the defense, it starts with the offense and kind of how you were talking about them not being as explosive as they want to be. Um, So when you're looking at that, I think that the defense is kind of viewed as a unit that can really keep them in games. Uh, and, and be uh, you know a, a difference maker. If you look at, at last week, they forced three fumbles, which is uh, an awesome sign to see from from you know Tim DeRuiter's first game. I think that uh, they were out on the field a lot longer than they probably wanted to be, but uh, they kind of had that bend on break, limited Fresno State to a couple field goals when they had a good field position. But I think the expectations are really high uh, for this team, that for this unit, I should say that the defense they're. they're Probably expected, I think, to, to have one of the top defenses in the Pac-12. If you think about how dominant they were in 19 uh, under Andy Avalos, definitely took a step back from that last year. But um, I, th- I think that all the all the talent is certainly there, especially at linebacker. I don't know if we can talk about more about that later with, with Noah Sewell and Justin Flo. Finally have those guys playing alongside each other, and uh, the results have looked pretty promising so far. Let's dive into the linebackers. I mean, Noah Sewell made a monstrous play with a with a uh, forced fumble and a great tackle this past week. Um, do you, uh, outside of Kayvon on the defensive line, do you feel that linebacker might be the strength of this defense? Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's definitely a, a, a strength for Oregon. Um, some people, I mean, I was kind of bouncing back and forth with this just because of the youth that they have. You had you saw Isaac Slade Matautia transfer out to SMU. Uh, during the off season, and that was arguably the most experienced defender on the entire side of the ball. So that kind of came as a as a surprise, and and they didn't have a lot of proven depth there. 
um, that you know keyword being proven depth. You know, a lot of a lot of recruiting talent there, sure. So good guys to pull from, but uh, not people who had seen a lot of action at the college level. Uh, so with, when you look at Justin Flo and how he performed against Fresno State and Noah Sewell as well, I mean that's just got to be really really exciting for the staff to to see that vision play out. But with all that said, I do think that their pass coverage is definitely an area that needs to improve. You know, they certainly bring the bring the juice off off the edge on pass rushes and against the run, but uh, maybe that's because of their youth. When when it comes time to to drop back back in pass coverage, looking a little lost at times against Fresno State. Well, and, uh, with experience, I'm sure that will continue to get better. Um, I'm glad you bring up the word recruiting because that was the next direction I wanted to take this. Um, obviously, everybody wants to know how things are going currently, but what's the what's the future of the program look like? Is is pretty quickly the next question. Um, how pleased are you and in, in your observations of the team with the way Coach Cristobal is uh, developing the Ducks of the future? I'm very pleased with, with how it's going. And if you're looking at the, the SI All-American team recruiting rankings, Ducks have the number five class in the country. And I think that's the the sweet spot that they need to be pushing for. Top class in the Pac-12, which is definitely a, is something to be to be happy about. But aside from USC, no one in the, in the Pac-12 really recruits near the level Oregon does. Uh, Chip Kelly turning things around a little bit and UCLA obviously got that big win uh, over LSU, but it's time to put the effort in on the recruiting trail, not something he was known for when he was here in Eugene. But so now that they have, you know, the, I feel like they have a pretty good handle on, on, you know, being able to set the standard in the Pac-12, they got to keep pushing forward and, and Mario Cristobal is not satisfied with, with where he's at. They have an incredible reach, getting talent from every corner of the country. They're building that presence in, in the Southeast as well, which is home to most of the, the best talent in the country, as well as Texas. If you're looking at the, the power states, you got California, Texas, and Florida. And Florida is that area that they really need to break into next. I wrote a piece on that a couple weeks ago. If they can break into Florida, they'll really be able to take that next step and join the rank, the rank among the ranks of, of Ohio State and um, just trying to, to be in that top five area they need to be. And they got guys like Cristobal, Alex Mirabal, Rod Chance, all with Florida ties, and it's time to make it happen. Is this the uh, the first game of the Alliance? <laughs> I know it's not being built that way, but uh, you know, I think it's kind of a natural question, right? I mean, the 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 biggest power in in the Big Ten right now, and and arguably the biggest power in the Pac-12. Um, you know, meeting in a couple of weeks after these two leagues and uh, the ACC informally announced this handshake, wink, wink agreement that they're going to all do things in lockstep uh, moving forward. So. Uh, you know, I guess I'm tongue in cheek wondering if this is the first game of the Alliance. I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it, but that's a good point. I guess it technically is the the first game of the Alliance. That was just that was huge news, but I think the way it was handled kind of suggested uh, you know the opposite. Like you were talking about, you know, I, I can't remember which commissioner was saying it, but they were basically saying, yeah, we don't need we don't need anything written, we don't need any kind of contract. We're just going to go ahead and do it, and we have all these you know, executives and people in administration at these schools on board. So there's got to be more to it than that. But um, seeing how far down the road it is, I, I guess I can understand in that in that regard how they're maybe not as concerned about it. Max Torres from Ducks Digest does a great job covering Oregon football. You can check out his work over on Ducks Digest. Uh, you can go on uh, the si.com slash college slash Oregon site and check him out there. Uh, before we let you go, I, I guess I'm, I'm hoping you can give us a a broader picture of, of the Pac-12 and just right now, you know, what the environment's like. You've got a relatively new commissioner, um, you know, the, the the media rights deal that's coming up here fairly soon. Uh, just the state of the league, right? I mean, the, the consideration of adding teams and apparently the decision not to. Um, you know, just your general sense right now on where Pac-12 football is, you know, how close maybe they are to – getting into that college football playoff selection, you know, more routinely, things like that. That's a great question. I think that it's, it's kind of a, a mixed bag with the PAC 12. They're, they're definitely not viewed how they want to be viewed in, in terms of the, the broader national picture, uh, especially when you're looking at college uh, football. I think that they, they've made a name for themselves, uh, you know, in some other sports, especially with UCLA and, and Oregon doing well last year in, in the NCAA tournament, but we're talking football here. I think that the, the Ducks are kind of like they're kind of like Oregon in that recruiting aspect, looking to take that next step. The Pac-12 needs to take that next step. They have a lot of teams 
uh, that, that were ranked in that initial top 25 that came out from the AP. But um, I think I think that I was listening to Josh Pay on Late Kick, and he made a good point saying that that they have a lot of good, not great teams. You have Oregon that was right out there outside of the top ten, but but they're looking to take that leap forward. So I, I think that it's definitely a lot of encouraging signs, especially with UCLA looking like like they uh, you know are, are the real deal this year. Granted, I, I want to caution that saying that you know it's it's only two. They're only two games in. A lot of these other schools are only one weekend, so we don't want to. I don't want to come off as someone who's just, you know, throwing all my stock into into week one, but I think that the the conference overall is 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 moving in the right direction. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how this season plays out to see if the the Oregon's and the USC's and the UCLA's can can ultimately solidify themselves. And uh, I think bowl season will be a, a great a great uh, way to to kind of figure that out. Obviously, that's a long ways away, but. So to answer your question, I feel like, and I feel like I kind of just went a long way about it. It's it's not where it needs to be, um, but I think that with with the the moves that they've made with with the new commissioner Klyovkov, uh, I think he'll he'll help them kind of get get moving in, in the right direction and hopefully establish themselves more nationally. I am definitely impressed with what I've heard so far from uh, from your new commissioner. I'd, uh, I I I think leadership is a really important thing when you're looking at the conference level and. Um, Big Ten fans certainly know that, and uh, I, I think the Pac-12 does have some momentum, and and is going to try to make a move here and and really uh, you know become more of a, a national player on the on the football scene here more than they are right now. This has been great, Max. Really appreciate your your time and your insight. Uh, I think we've got a better idea what to expect here with the Oregon Ducks, and certainly looking forward to uh, welcoming you to Columbus. Uh, this is uh, a, a special game, even beyond just uh, being a big matchup. Uh, this is the 132nd year of Ohio State football, but the 100th season of football at Ohio Stadium. And this is the first game uh, in shoe here this year. So uh, it will certainly be a memorable one between Ohio State and Oregon and look forward to hosting you. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me, Brendan.